John Mahambu makes a comparison, different kinds of meditators. Some people, he say, have a mind like a tree out in the middle of a meadow. If you're going to cut the tree down, you don't have to use much skill or any great insight. You don't have to figure things out much. Just decide which direction you want the tree to fall, and you cut it, and it falls down. It's not entangled with anything else, so it falls easily. Other people, he said, are like people who are mind like a tree in the forest. Its branches are entangled with a lot of other trees. If you're going to cut that tree down, you have to figure out which branches to cut first and figure out the right angle so the tree will fall down and not get caught on other trees. The first type of people are those who don't have to use a lot of discernment in getting their mind to settle down. Just focus on the breath, focus on bhutto or whatever your topic is going to be, and the mind just immediately takes to it. Other people are not like that. They have to figure things out first. They have to have reasons, one, for letting go of outside preoccupations, and two, have a good reason to settle in with the, the breath or whatever their object may be. So in cases like this, the Buddha says, you can either direct the mind to get it to settle down, or you can practice not directing the mind. Directing the mind means giving yourself reasons to settle down. You try to stay with the breath, and you can't stay with the breath. You try to stay with the body, you can't stay with the body. As the Buddha says, you get a fever in the body as you try to focus on it. In other words, there's not a good fit between the mind and the object. So you have to back off a bit and take a more indirect approach. Give yourself good reasons for settling down. You can think about the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha. Think about the principle of karma, that the mind needs to be trained. Or you can work with the breath itself, changing the way you breathe, changing the place where you focus, trying to use different concepts of the breath to see what creates a sensation of ease and well-being right here. So you can see that by settling down here, it really does feel good. You can see the benefits coming in the body. If you find that you have a tense spot in the body or a place where things feel blocked. You can spend your time working on working through the blockage, which requires first that you get at least some sense of comfort in the breath someplace else in the body. Take that as your touchstone, then to apply to that same sense of ease, well-being, easy flow of the breath. To the parts of the body that are not so comfortable. If you have an injury, try to work the breath energy through the injury. Don't let it get stuck there. In other words, you give your mind reasons for wanting to focus in right here, because you see that it actually does accomplish something important. As for not directing the mind, basically means if you see yourself wandering off to someplace else, you remind yourself of you remind yourself of why you don't want to go there. You can look at the drawbacks of that kind of thinking. Thinking about the past, what does that get you? You can't go back to the past. You can't go back and change it. You can't go back and live there. I heard someone say a while back that one of his ways of trying to get the mind to have a sense of well-being was to think about how healthy he used to be. And I can't see how that would be a, a useful way of getting the mind to settle in and feel good about itself, because the health is gone. As you get older, things begin to fall apart. So what is getting tied up in the past do for you. It does really nothing. 
as for the future, you don't really know what's going to happen. There's so many uncertainties out there. What you do know is that if anything comes up in the future, you're going to need mindfulness, you're going to need alertness, you're going to need discernment in order to deal with it. So rather than thinking about dealing with this eventuality or dealing with that eventuality, you want to develop the qualities that you need regardless of the eventuality. And that kind of contemplation brings you back to the present. In other words, if you find your mind getting stuck on anything, you just learn how to cut, cut, cut your fascination with that object. In terms of the, the Buddha's classic ways of dealing with distractions, this falls under just not paying attention to any distraction or relaxing any tension in the body around the distraction that would correspond correspond to the thought. Because when you're thinking about something that's not right here, right now, not, not immediately apparent, you've got to create a little false world in the mind. And the creation of that false world, in order to have an anchor, needs to have a little spot of tension in the body. So when you find yourself thinking about something, ask yourself, when that thought arose, what tensed up? What happens if you untense that spot in the body? Or in the final method, you clench your teeth, press your tongue against the roof of the mouth, and decide, I am not going to think that thought. And as you do whatever you can to blot out that thought, you're not directing your mind in that direction. The mind eventually, where will it go? It'll have to settle down in the present moment. And there you are. So there are two ways of getting the mind into the present. If it doesn't settle down naturally, one is to think of ways that will encourage you to settle it down, to see the value of focusing on the breath, value of getting the mind in the present. And the other is to reflect on how you really don't want to get entangled with anything else. You see the drawbacks of any other kind of thinking, you just let it go, let it go, let it go. In the process of letting go, where are you going to land? You land right here. The breath is always there. I've read one place where people explain these two different methods as the difference between concentration practice and mindfulness practice, which they divide into two radically different modes of practice. Concentration is where you willfully focus your mind in the present moment, keep it in a very narrow range. Whereas mindfulness, according to them, is more wide open and accepting not focused on anything at all. Well, one, that's not how the Buddha taught concentration and mindfulness. Concentration, remember, is full body awareness. It's actually quite broad. Concentration on goodwill extends not only to the body, but out in all directions, to all beings. And it's both concentration and a kind of mindfulness. And as for mindfulness practice, as the, the Buddha calls it a kind of concentration, which you can do with directed thought and evaluation or without directed thought and evaluation, with a sense of pleasure, a sense of rapture, a sense of equanimity. In other words, there's no clear line between mindfulness and concentration. And mindfulness is very much directed. Remember the Buddha's analogy for mindfulness in the body, you're carrying a bowl of oil filled to the brim on top of your head. And the path you're walking along has, on the one side, a beauty queen singing and dancing, on the other side a crowd of people are really excited about the beauty queen singing and dancing. And following right behind you is a man with a sword upraised. And he's determined that if you spill a drop of oil at any point, he's going to cut your head off right there. Now, as the Buddha said, the person carrying the bowl of oil on his head, would he allow his mind to get distracted over to the crowd or over to the beauty queen? Not at all. He's got to focus right there on the bowl of oil. And that, he says, is an analogy for mindfulness immersed in the body. There are many other similes where the Buddha points out that mindfulness is very directed, very focused. So it's not that mindfulness is undirected and concentration is directed. They're both focused. They're both directed. 
silly that mindfulness shades into concentration when it finally does get settled down. Now, the ways of settling down, as I said, are two. One is thinking your way in by trying to get the mind to latch on to the object of mindfulness. And if it can't, you use other ways of thinking that get it there. And the other is just consciously not thinking about this, not thinking about that. Anything comes up, you drop it. Anything comes up, you drop it. And by letting go in this way, you land naturally on the breath. You land on your awareness of what's happening here in the present moment. So these are not two different ways of meditating, where this particular instruction is not showing the difference between concentration and mindfulness. It's just showing two different ways you get the mind to be mindful and concentrated. So if you find yourself having trouble settling down, remember there are these two ways of doing it. Thinking in ways that will get you more and more interested in the present moment, and thinking in ways that get you dis <coughs> get uninterested in anything that would pull you away from the present moment. The first method is more closely related to basada getting a sense of confidence that this is something you really want to do. The second method is more closely related with sangwega, realizing that all the different thoughts that you could think that would pull you away from the present moment are not really worth it. They don't go anywhere. They take a lot of energy and they don't give you much in return. So at any one point you'll find yourself using one method or the other to get the mind to settle down. Just remember that you have these different tools at your disposal. So that on the days when the mind doesn't want to settle down easily, you've got lots of different things to do, lots of different ways to try to get it to settle down. You're not limited to just one or two ways. That we can cut the branches of the entangled other trees and get the tree to fall right where you want it. Right here. <laughs>